Hello, welcome to River Reflections. You just saw a clip from our church, River of Life Ministries. And you know you're welcome. If you've watched this program anytime, you know you're welcome to come and visit. I appreciate those of you from time to time. I'll see you at Meyer or somewhere out shopping, and you'll say you have heard me on here, and you appreciate it. You know, that's really, when that happens, uh, if I remember, I usually tell the staff or the church or whatever, Sometimes I plumb forget because life gets really busy. But I appreciate it when you do that. And please know if you're looking for a church home, you really need to check out our church. And the Lord will show you where you belong. You, you might just have a really nice, enjoyable visit at River of Life and say, hmm, every now and again I'd like to visit there, but maybe you go to another place and go, this is where God has me. Or you come to River and say, finally... I found the place that I'm looking for. If you're like me, like my husband can say to me, now just exactly what do you want for the ceiling fan or the kitchen fixture? And I'm like, when I see it, I'll know it. Same thing, go and buy a dress or whatever. And I believe the sheep are the same thing with if you're looking for a church home. I believe that the Holy Spirit can quickly say to you, this is it. This is where you're supposed to be right now. I had that years ago. I went to Bethel Pentecostal Church, actually just to see the choir. They were back on Sherman and Eastern Southeast, 1971 or two, somewhere through there. And man, I got in there and I was just at home, which is very illogical if you've ever been there and you're looking at me and you go there. But you know what? I stayed four or five years, came back from California, stayed another quite a while. I loved it. And I knew that I knew that's where I needed to be at that time. Meaning, if you're looking for a church home, just keep on visiting places and God will show you. I hope he brings you to river. But if not, I hope you feel free to visit any time. Because we're unique, as is every church, but we're really unique in that we're like a house church inside of a building. Meaning, we're very interactive, um, friendly. We will notice you. You will not sit in the back and wonder if you're invisible. That will not happen. In fact, if you like to be invisible, you might want to forget about visiting our church because it's not going to happen. We notice people and we love on people. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Now, if you want to be invisible, let, us, let one of us know and then somehow we'll get the message across to everybody else and we'll try to leave you alone. Uh, It'd be hard for us, but we'll try to accommodate that need in you. But anyway, the last time we did River Reflection programs, I did Philemon Part 1, Philemon Part 2, and now hopefully I'll get through 3 and 4 and finish this one book. Well, you've already guessed, I'm sure, that when I do a book, I do verse references and commentary kind of speaking, and that's why it takes me so long to go through word meanings, nuances, and I've been having a really, and our church too has been amazingly patient as I've been staying on this one chapter for, since the beginning of the month, and now we're a week from the end of it, so that tells you something. Anyway, just to do a little bit of review, hopefully I don't take the whole time doing a review, then there'll be a part five and six, probably, but hopefully not. Hopefully I get through this so I can move on to another topic. But we'll see how I get led of the Spirit of God, see what happens. But overall view of Philemon, Philemon was a man who had a looks-like slave who ran away from home. Then Paul happened to be in prison at the time, and some way he hooked up with Philemon, ministered, not Philemon, the slave named Onesimus. And by the way, every preacher I've heard talk about that slave, there's a different pronunciation. I picked one and I stick to it, Onesimus. But I've heard other, I don't know if that's the right one. It's just how I call him. But anyway, Paul met up with Onesimus, ministered salvation to him. His heart went out to him. He calls him his son in the Lord because he, he begot him through salvation in the Lord. And so Paul knew the owner master, Philemon. And this letter is an appeal to Philemon to receive Onesimus back. He's sending him back to Philemon. 
and he's assuring Philemon that, that Onesimus is born again. He's a brother in the Lord, and he will never run away again because Paul learned what Onesimus is like and chose to believe that his character was now being uh, submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, right off the bat, you might say, good grief. You mean to tell me that Paul actually told a slave to go back home? What about Harriet Tubman? She's a heroine because before slavery was ended in the United States, she put up a underground railroad so that slaves could run away and then move on to safety, uh, usually not only through the northern states, or could I say often ending up in Canada in order to flee slavery, and she was a heroine. Yep, that's all true. But for whatever reason, in this case, Paul told Onesimus to go back. And furthermore, you will remember, Paul happened to be a Roman citizen by birth, in spite of the fact that he was a Jew. But most of the Jews were under Roman occupation and had to kowtow and submit to the Romans rather than to fellow Jews. So everybody was in a hard place during that particular time. Bear that in mind. Plus, Christians were being persecuted for the gospel as well. So evidently, Paul thought it was in both Onesimus and Philemon's best interest for this runaway slave to return back home. So having said all that, in the first two programs, I got through, I think, up to verse 6. And he's still talking to Philemon. You could read those first six verses on your own. If I read them, I'm afraid I'm going to make a whole new sermon again. So I'm going to move on to verse 7. He's talking to Philemon. Remember, he's appealing to him to take Onesimus back. He's already told him how much faith and love that he believes on that, uh, Philemon has, and he's trusting that Philemon's going to do the right thing. Now, in his ongoing addressing Philemon, building him up in the Lord, encouraging him, in verse 7, Paul says to him, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brother. Now, I usually read King James for a whole list of reasons, but I'm well aware that it gets rather clumsy in this particular verse because nobody ever talks about the seat of our affection as bowels. But that's what he's talking about here. The seat of our affection, our very innermost being, is refreshed by you, Philemon, is what he's saying. And the word refresh here means they're quieted. Our innermost being, when you're around, is quieted, is made at peace by you. Now, sometimes when we think of refresh, we think about rejuvenated, re-energized. We think about we're ready for more action. But in this particular point, it's more like, oh, we're all together relating and we're sitting in a circle, maybe by a bonfire, I can imagine. And finally, we can just be at ease, relax, and enjoy one another. And after that, we probably will be re-energized. But that word is self-refreshed. And you can, I'm encouraging you to dig yourself, look it up yourself, and see what it means in the Greek. That's what I found, that it means quieted. And because of that, um, he said, we have great joy. Because when you come around Philemon, oh, it is such a relief. It's so peaceful. You just bring in... You know, the Bible talks about the kingdom of God being righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Well, we're, if we're walking in the kingdom of God, we're going to bring righteousness, right living, peace, absence of all conflict, and joy in the Holy Ghost if we're submitted to the king and walking in kingdom principles. And he's telling that to Philemon. By the way, joy here is cheerfulness and calm delight. Do you know anybody that when they walk in the, the door 
you're like, you know, not even if it's not your natural dad, you can say, oh, good, daddy's here, or mama's here, and you know things are going to be put at rest, everything's going to be fine, that person really loves the Lord and people, and their very presence gives calm delight when they walk in the room. We don't want to be that person. Yeah, I know people joke and say, here comes trouble. I know people joke. But every now and then it's true. Here comes trouble. We were all at peace and here comes Miss Drama Queen that's going to dig up dirt and talk about somebody. And we're all going to be glad when they leave because now we can be at peace again. Things will be calm and joyful again. We want to be the person that brings that. And that's what he's saying about Philemon. That's verse 7. This is how this inner affection prompts us to act. Now I'm going to do a cross reference where the same bowels word is used. The seat of our affection. And when we're renewed in that area, when we walk right in the area of our inner affection, this is how we act. Philippians 2. This is Philippians, not Philemon. Another book. Philippians 2 verse 1. If there therefore be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, in other words, if our inner affection is filled with love and mercy and comfort and fellowship, he says in verse 2, Paul again writing in Philippians 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. See, that would be the opposite of refreshing people. When you come up with empty boasting and strife, you know, oh, look at my fingernails. I just got them done today, and I got a pedicure, too. And I'm thinking, whoop de that is sheer vanity. It's fun. There's nothing wicked about it, but it's vanity. It's nothing to boast about. It's vain glory. It's empty boasting or hairdo or new ring or whatever. Things of this earth that people boast in and try to have one up and sober. That nothing should be done through that. It should all be in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other than better themselves. And and four, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Those are bowels and mercies. Those are deep-seated affection and merciful thinking. 1 John 3, verse 14, We know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby we perceive the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. And I just set up the context of being on the way for where, again, those bowels of compassion, those bowels are brought up. Verse 17 of 1 John chapter 3. Whosoever has this world's good, and seeing his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? We have to, the, the Greek word for bowels, as well as being the seat of emotions and, and passions, but the absolute meaning is spleen. They refer to the spleen, it's an organ inside of us, as the seat of emotions and passions. And Paul is saying over back in Philemon, don't, uh, Philippians, don't shut up those deep-seated affections. You know what? There's a thing today where some people literally um, have a goal of not feeling, of staying numb, because they've opened up their heart and their heart got stamped on. But you know what? If you exercise yourself of growing up into Christ, then when you open up your affections to people freely and they stomp on it, you you hide in Christ and you understand that he did the same thing. He came on to his own, his own received him not, but he didn't make himself numb to feeling. In fact, 
often when he'd heal people or deliver people from demons, it's because he was moved with compassion. Those bowels of compassion in him, the seat of his affections, he kept that part of his heart open and vulnerable even though people wounded him immensely by rejecting him. He wept over Jerusalem because his own people rejected him. He longed for them to receive him and they rejected him. But he didn't make himself numb like a lot of people do today. I'm hard. I don't feel as if that's a badge of macho honor. That's not honor. That's, that's pitiful. We as saints need to keep our affection vulnerable and open to others. When we get wounded, we need to go run into Jesus. And by the way, that word refreshing, that same word rest is used in Matthew 11:28. We have to be like Jesus, right? And Jesus said in Matthew 20, Matthew 11, verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Opposite of being refreshed. Just overwhelmed with cares and concerns. And he said, I will give you rest. Jesus is saying, I will refresh you. I'll give you rest. Okay, now, we're supposed to be just like Christ in this life. And so like Paul is saying to Philemon, you refresh the saints. Same word that Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you rest. We as saints should say, come into my space and I will minister peace, rest, refreshing to you. Oh, God help us. Because so often we just can't wait for somebody we love to get in our space so we can just ventilate and complain about everything we went through during the day and how somebody else did us wrong. And I'm just as guilty as doing that from time to time as the next person. And as I read this, that Philemon was like that and Jesus was like that. And we're expected to be the same way. I am convicted and... You know, we're always working on our own salvation, our own completion in Christ with fear and trembling. And there's an area I want to uh, work at to become like that, to refresh others, to give rest and peace to other people. Okay, now I am going to move on. Philemon, chapter 1, there only is one chapter, verse 8. Now remember, Paul is appealing to Philemon to take Onesimus back. So he's going on. He's already told Philemon, you know, I've heard of your faith and love. I know what you're like. He's building him up. He's, he's not trying to say to Philemon, you're a lousy person. There's no way I'd want anybody to go back to you. He's trying to build up Philemon. And in the next verse, he wants to get a little stronger. And he says, wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is convenient or proper. Okay, now, we got to look at some word definitions in order for you to understand. That word bold used there is the same word that when the Lord says to us, come boldly to the throne of, of grace, it's the same word, and it means to be outspoken. In other words, I could come up to you and speak my mind totally with no holds bars, no punches pulled, no restraint whatsoever. I could do that. And I could command you if I wanted to. Enjoin means to command. That's what that means. He said, I could do that with you. To command that you do that which is appropriate and proper. And then he says in verse 9, Yet for love's sake, I'd rather beseech thee. I'm going to plead with you in a loving fashion rather than say, look, buddy, you take this dude back. You, owe, you know, you owe me a lot. I'm telling you, do it. End of story. He says, because I love you. And that love there is agape, which is the same kind of love God has. Because I love you, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to treat you with loving, meek, touch. I'm not going to command you. You know, I was thinking about as your kids grow up. You know, when they're six and seven, you say, you respect your mother. Or you will eat all that and you will stop complaining about your food. You need to be grateful. You talk like that to a six-year-old. When your kid is maybe 19 and they're still at home, you say, you know... 
I know you love your mom, and she has really worked hard at this meal, and it's discouraging when you keep complaining and you don't eat half of it and you treat it like it's nothing that it took her in, you know, 45 minutes to prepare it and you take one look at it and disrespect what she did. Now I can talk like that to a, a 18, 19 year old and maybe for love's sake they'll do the right thing. But a six year old, you just tell them what to do. You don't do all this beseeching and lollygagging around. You just tell them how he's supposed to act. And there's a difference between that. And he's more treating Philemon like with loving respect and beseeching rather than commanding. And there's something that even as a pastor, I have to work on that. And I do. I very seldom say, okay, you guys, this is what you're going to do. I usually like, okay, this is a good reason, blah, blah, blah. And uh, really be nice if you do it this way. And sure appreciate it if everybody makes sure before you leave the nurseries, but whatever. Instead of, you know what, you guys, you need to get that nursery picked up every time. Now, I'm going to say it to a kid, but there's a difference how you deal with different people. But he said, I'd rather beseech you, and now he brings out, see, I was talking to my husband about this today, of how Paul still manages to lay a guilt trip. Being such a one as Paul, the aged and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm sitting up here in, in prison and I'm old too. It's like, okay, you just told me you were going to ask me kindly, but now you're reminding me how old you are and you're sitting up in jail. If you care at all about Paul, how are you going to not do what he's asking you to do? I, I noticed that about Paul. He can throw in a couple of zingers here and there. But he goes on to say in verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I've begotten in my bonds. He ministered salvation to Onesimus. Onesimus apparently was kind of naughty, and by the time Paul got to him, he became a brother in the Lord. And it says in verse 11, now Onesimus' very name means useful. Useful. And so he plays on that word, means profitable. Useful, profitable, same thing. Which in time past was to the unprofitable, but now is profitable to the and to me. Okay, now he's going to live up to his name, Philemon. You might, you might, and guess what else? I'm sending him back to you, but I sure could use him right here. So I'm doing you a favor. But he's recognizing that because he belonged to Philemon, it was the right thing to do. By the way, and see, I might start out in review on this point next time because I really analyzed this one heavily. He's saying Onesimus is going to be profitable. And I, that means to yield advantageous returns or results. I invest in this and I get an advantage from it. I get increased thereby, be it a person, place, or thing. I plant a garden, it gives me an advantage, the advantage of having food right in my backyard instead of having to go to the grocery store and pay four times the amount for that food. That's an advantage. It's something that benefits the possessor. And a benefit is something that produces something good or helpful. He's referring to Onesimus as now being able to bear an advantage for Philemon. Now, this is what I want to bring out that I think is not popular to think about, but I think it's very biblical and right. And that is, and you know this is true, you have friends that you are a mutual advantage to one another. Now, if your friend that you've been friends with for 20 years gets in a horrible accident and has to now, you know, they lose both arms and they talk to you. I interviewed somebody on TV like this one time. He literally communicated with me through tapping out words on a machine at his feet. And there was like a computer screen where I saw what he was saying to me. Now, if that had been my friend for 20 years, and that was true, you rely, like they said about um, the widow, 
support her if while she was able. She washed the saints' feet. She was hospitable. In other words, when she was able to do things, she did them. And that's the way we feel about people that have become disabled. They're no longer profitable in the same way they once were. But note this. If we have a friend who is a mutual advantage, we're mutually advantageous for each other, and that friend more and more becomes the town drunk, and they're more and more asking everybody else for money, not doing anything for anybody, laying up drunk all the time. And by the way, I for one do not believe it's a disease, alcoholism. I believe some people have a harder time resisting because of their genetics and propensities, but I also believe, and why do I believe that it's a sin? Because the Lord says that it's wrong to be um, a glutton and a, a drunkard. So I don't believe God's going to say something's wicked that in fact is a disease you can't help. Now, if my friend becomes an alcoholic and wants help, what, me and everybody else who loves them are going to do all they can to help them, maybe even gather the money to go to Teen Challenge. But this is what I want to say. When somebody who was once profitable becomes unprofitable and doesn't even care, begins to get lazy and lays up on everybody else, fooling around with everybody in town, there's a point at which you say, you know what, I'm not, I still love them, but I'm not their active friend anymore. And in today's society, people don't look kindly at that kind of decision. But I believe there is a place for, and I'm going to start out with the same point in the next program, but there is a place for, we were once both profitable. I don't keep score on, man, I'm more profitable to you than you are to me. That's not even the point, because there are relationships where one is helping the other one more than vice versa. But at least there's some reciprocation and not all. I'm never going to lift up a dish rag, and you're going to do everything. You don't, you don't keep friends like that, that are doing all the taking but none of the giving. And this is what Paul is talking about here with Philemon. Now he's going to be profitable again. Well, my time is up. I appreciate you listening. Hopefully in the next program I can actually get through the book, but it's beginning to be rather dubious, but we'll see what happens. God bless you for listening.